Well, good morning. Welcome to Calvary. And you are welcome. Thank you for being here today. You having a good day? It's December 1st, folks. December 1st, beginning of the Christmas season, huh? You're going to buy a lot of presents for me? Yeah. Don't. <laughs> if you have any thought of buying the pastor a present, because that's what people do, that's great. Take the money and give it to someone that needs it, okay? I'm loaded, okay? Don't worry about me. I got everything I need, and I'm on my way to heaven, so it's all good. But I'm thankful that you're here today. I'm excited about today. I'm always excited about it. But uh, a couple of announcements I'd like to make as we go through this. One, new potluck rules. That's just silliness. Just a reminder, we're not having the potluck today. The potluck is next Sunday. And you should have received an email telling you where the, where the meal train was. If you didn't get that email, just see me afterwards, and I'll make sure your email is in there. Okay, we'll get that down. But we'll have a good time next week. Uh, we're going to have a potluck after the Lord's table, which is really the highlight of that day. Potluck is a whole lot of fun, but I love the Lord's table. And so then as well, so Christmas caroling. Okay, is, this is important. December 15th, immediately after service, we're going Christmas caroling right down the street. It's an important, next week I'm going to poll you. I'm going to twist your arms. I want to find who's going, because I'm not going there with just Martha and I and Joanna. Okay? Uh, I want a lot of us there to do this. And we have, we already have folks, we have, we have the song books all set up. You can read the songs. You know the songs. You know these songs, okay? And we have these flyers. These flyers have been sent already down to, to our Doggett Circle. They've been distributed by the town to everyone. And during the week, we're going to try and go down. Maybe you have some time. I'm trying to give some out to some people down there to give them a personal invitation to come out to Christmas caroling. We're going to have sandwiches for them and stuff, but it's a way of us reaching out to someone else. It's so important for us to do that. A lot of other things that we're going to give out at the end of service, but I'd like to do first, more importantly, is for us to stand and worship in song, if we could, please. Oops. Since it's December 1st, we're going to start with a Christmas song. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight on.
Amen. Thank you. Beautiful song, huh? It is well with my soul. Remember, you are a soul. You happen to have a body, all right? It's a strange way of thinking of things, but that's the truth of the matter. Someday this tent is going to be gone. Pete will be here no more, but my soul is going to be someplace. That's a cool thought in reality. A little scary, a little scary, but uh, please, you know, uh, you're going to be standing up a little bit longer. Remember, I'm going to preach a long time, so you're going to give a long time to sit, okay? But if you can remain standing, Brother Dan is going to come up. He's going to read our scripture for us from Acts chapter 8. He's got a long text to read. I want to get off the hook for this one. So he's got a microphone and everything. So please, pay attention to the word of God. Good morning. Acts 8, 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Cadence, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Amen. Glory Thank, the Lord. You. Thank you, folks. Well, you can grab a seat if you'd like, folks. And I think the children would like to get on to Junior Church if you'd like to, children. Yeah. Going to have a good crew down there. We've got a good crew down there in the, uh, in the nursery today. You know, we're going to see how those, those, those uh, nursery workers are hanging out. They got the, it's three on two. I don't know how it's going to work out, you know, but we'll see how that goes. But uh, it's good to be here this morning. It really is. And I tell this message, it's kind of a strange title, right? The Christianity that I know. It's sort of like I'm talking about me. Well, I'm not. I'm talking about the Christianity I know because it's found in the Word of God. And, and, and it really comes out in this text. It really does. And it's a funny thing about this text that Dan read that lengthy text. This is the first text I ever preached back in the mid-80s. And uh, I preached it a couple of times. But it's funny, every time I, 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 I give this word, it comes out different. It just does. I, don't, I can't understand it. You know, it, it just does. And I came up with this whole thing. The Christianity I know came out of this text. It just happened some way. And we look at this text. There's a couple of things I want us to see when it's look, looking at this text. The Christianity I know. The Christianity I know is inclusive. It's inclusive of everyone, of everyone. But we'll also see that it's a religion that's exclusive. And you say, well, how can it be inclusive and exclusive? That's impossible, right? Of course it is. That's why it's of God, folks. There's things we don't understand in the word of God, and of course we won't, because it is of God. If it was possible, we would do it. But we don't. We don't know how to. I mean... Think of it, we can't create something out of nothing, can we? Nah, we can't. So just a few points we'd like to go through today as we go through this message. We're going to look at the settings and the characters because there's a lot happening in here, okay? We're not going to look at every single verse today, folks. There is, this is, this, these, these, what, 14 verses is jammed, okay? We'll look at the setting and the characters. We're going to look at the encounter that takes place between Philip and this eunuch. And we're going to look at the eunuch's faith. Those are the... Three things I like to focus on, and a few more. 
that we'll get to. But before we do that, let's stop. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's just focus our minds. Let's forget about everything that's outside us right now. Take do, 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 like, do yoga, right? My wife and I do yoga sometimes at night, right? We're in the, our living room, we're on our mats, and we learn to breathe. I know, I've been breathing for 60, 70 years. Breathe. <sighs> forget about outside the walls. Just forget about it. And let's just concentrate on this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your word. There's so much packed into this, Lord. Father, I see Christianity pouring out of these verses, Lord. I pray that uh, we would all see this as well, and uh, you would be magnified for it, Lord. That we have peace in our souls because of you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. So, there we are. Three points. The setting and the characters. Okay, that's what we're going to look at first, right? Now, the setting of this, this is not long after the ascension, after Christ has ascended, ascended to heaven, right? This is not long after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came on to the disciples in a way the Holy Spirit has never manifested before, and 3,000 were added to the church. A lot's happened. We're in the book of Acts now. Book of Acts is an action book, okay? Not a doctrinal book, it's an action book. A lot is happening. The book of Acts is the formation of the church. It's just happening in there. It's, just, it's ongoing. It starts out one way, and it ends another way. That's what it does. But for the background of this, we need to remember that this Philip that was in this text, he was one of the first deacons that there ever were in the Bible, that when deacons were defined. Okay? It says in Acts 6, just going back a little bit, we need to know the setting. It says, and the saying pleased the multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nic Nicantor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on him. See, Philip was one of those first seven deacons, okay, in there. He's in there along with, with Stephen as well. And it's kind of interesting, when you look at those guys, see, notice Nicholas, the proselyte from Antioch? That kind of means he was a proselyte. That meant that first, he was a Gentile. He became a Jew. And now he's a Christian. A whole path. So think of that. Uh, one of the first deacons that was in there. It's just interesting when you pick the word of God apart. All these little nuances come out. It really is. It's so important. It's beautiful. Uh, uh, when, you, when you look at this, right? But when you continue on for that, oh, and remember this Stephen here? Who was Stephen? Stephen was the, what, was, what was the deacon. He was stoned to death for proclaiming Christ, right? He was stoned to death. And who oversaw that in, in Acts chapter 7? Saul, who later we call Paul, right? He oversaw the stoning of Stephen, and he was persecuting the church. And what happened with that persecution, as we follow through it, it says, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So there we have it. Philip disperses from Jerusalem, and he goes to Samaria, to the dreaded Sam Samaritans, right? He goes there, and he's preaching Christ to them. Understand this. Philip was an evangelist. He was a deacon, but he was an evangelist. He's called Philip the Evangelist for a reason. He was the first one of these early believers to just take that road right into Samaria to start giving the word of God. And he goes there. But then in verse 26, he receives a message from an angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord tells him to go down to Gaza. Go down to Gaza by Jerusalem, down there, to a desert place. He's being spoken to by God. Go to a desert place. Now, when I think of going to a desert place, I think desert and die, right? I mean, I'm a New Englander, right? I can deal with snow, but going to a desert is a scary thing. But that's where the Lord sent him. See, the people in this part of the world, they understood deserts. They knew how to live in them. Me, not so much. We would not, we would not, I would not survive well there. So there's Philip, sort of in a nutshell. Then there's this man, the eunuch, this eunuch, okay? And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority. He was a top dog. He was a big dude. Under, under Candace, uh, the queen of Ethiopians, who had charge over all of her treasury, he came and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. So this eunuch has traveled from Ethiopia all the way up to Jerusalem in Israel, right? He's gone there to worship. So the first thing you might want to notice about that is Judaism had, uh, had spread a lot further than just Israel. It's all the way down to Ethiopia. 
and the continent of Africa. So there's his journey. There's the continent of Africa. I, folks, I know I love maps, right? I like to know where people are going. Continent of Af Africa is huge, this continent. The red circle's Ethiopia, the black circle up there, that's where Israel would be. It's not even listed. Remember, Israel is really tiny, folks. I want you to keep this in mind. There's so much battling going on over Israel, right? Israel is 1 19th the size of California. One, that, this is little. You can drive across it real quick, OK, a few hours. And when he made that trek to and from Ethiopia going to Jerusalem, that was 1,500 miles, 1,500 miles. Put it in context. From Boston to Miami is 1,200 miles. Want to go for a walk to Miami, anyone? Think about it. Just think about what these people did. It's crazy, right? He went, that's what he did. So he's sitting in a chariot, and uh, he, he's there. Oh, I want to, he's riding, and he's going to the chariot. But I want you to think of this, because it doesn't say this, but he was not alone. He was a big dude in, 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 in Ethiopia, right? He had servants with him. He had protection. He's riding in a really nice chariot. I want to tell you this. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. He had a canopy over him. He's in the desert. These people weren't foolish. They were shading themselves. Don't think of chariots like the old Ben-Hur movie with guys whipping each other and stuff. These chariots, this is how they traveled. They were very practical, OK? And someone else is at the reins, OK, running the chariot, and his horses or oxen pulling it. That's how it would have been when they went there. He's there. And he was a eunuch. He was a man that has been emasculated. He will father no children, and he will have no legacy. Do you understand this? By appointment or by choice, this man has been sexually altered. He's a eunuch. And the funny thing about eunuchs in a manner of speaking, we wouldn't think this way, but if you became a eunuch, you're a man in a government system, it allows you to rise up in power because of the word trust. Not like the trust we think about Jesus. We say, I, I believe in Jesus is one thing, but do you trust in Jesus, really having faith in it? But it was a trust that the leaders in the government would have because if this man had been sexually altered, he could not mess around with the king or the emperors or whoever's wives or concubines or women. It was very selfish in a manner of speaking. You were, con you were a eunuch to rise up in there. It was strange, isn't it? Case in point, go back to the book of Esther. You will find that Esther was surrounded and protected and tended to by eunuchs because King Ahasuerus trusted them because he knew that they could have no sexual activity with his wife Esther, the queen. It's a strange thing. It's different than our culture, right? I get it. I understand. Don't judge. This is the culture of the world then, not the, just that part of the world. This was ubiquitous. This is in the Orient and other places. That's what eunuchs were all about. And it's an important, it's very important for this text, and it's sometimes overlooked, OK? So this man, he's in charge of Candace's, Queen Candace's uh, 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 all of her money. He's like the treasury of the, uh, the secretary of the treasury of the United States. He's basically reporting to the president. This is a very, very important man when you get right down to it. He really is. He really is. And you get down to there. And he's traveling back to Ethiopia after worshiping. Then comes the encounter, the encounter that takes place. And sitting in his chariot, he's reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit of Philip says, go near and take the take, uh, go near to the chariot, overtake the chariot. Love maps. I love maps. We got another one here. There we go. There's a map for you. So there's a picture, OK? See where Jerusalem is, sort of in the middle circle? So Philip was told to go up to Samaria. I mean, he, was, he went up to Samaria to preach, right? Then an angel of the Lord told him to go down to Gaza. And now the spirit of the Lord has him going down to the desert area. That's that blue arrow. And the yellow arrow, that's, there you have the, the eunuch leaving Jerusalem, going down to the desert area. They're coming together. I don't know where exactly. The Bible doesn't tell us. But it's a desert area. So they're leaving the area where there would have been a lot of civilization, going down here, and they're going to meet. And Philip goes at the command of the Spirit, OK? Going into a desert area. It's tough stuff, folks. It really is. He obeys. And you got a picture. He, and when he shows up at the chariot, what's the, what's the, what, think of the eunuch, right? He's scrolling on his phone reading Isaiah, right? That's what we would think of, right? That's what we do now. We scroll on our phones. He had a scroll with him. You know, because if he had a scroll, that would have meant he was very, very wealthy, folks. The written word was precious. He had a scroll of Isaiah. Big deal. It really is. 
We, we take it for granted because you got pew, you know, you have Bibles down by your knees. We have all this stuff all around us. That's the, but that's not how it was at that time, not at all. So there he is, and Philip runs up to him and he says to him, Do you understand what you're reading? What? Do you understand what you're reading? Let me encourage you when you encounter people, right? Ask them questions. Ask people questions. It's a healthy thing to do. Don't come to a person and start telling them things. I know better than you. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. No. Ask questions. Ask people questions. Find out where they're at. We need to make people our habit. We need to speak to people and have an understanding of where they're coming from. Jesus asked a lot of questions. He asked a lot of questions. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you not do what I say? That's a good question to be asking yourself sometimes, huh? Who touched me? Remember he said that to a woman with an issue of blood? His question to her was amazing. It changed her life completely. And he did that. Who do you say I am? That was a heart-cutting question that Jesus asked to his own disciples. Who do you say I am, guys? Think of that question coming up. Who, who do you say I am? They did come up with the right answer then, right? You are the Christ. But you ought to wonder sometimes, right? What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his own soul? People are chasing after things of the world, aren't they? Maybe you need to ask someone that question sometimes. They're so busy doing these things. I, I don't have time to go to that church with you. I'm busy. I'm doing this on Sunday. Well, what about your soul? Because people don't even think about their soul. We're thinking about our bodies, right? Body's going to be gone, folks. I worked out yesterday. I want to keep this machine running. Body's going to be gone. Soul is what matters. Okay? I'm going to run this baby as long as I can. I'm changing the oil. We're going to be gone. The soul is what matters. Why do you call me good when no one, when, when one, when no one is good but one? That is God. There's Jesus speaking to that rich young ruler. And do you notice what comes out of that? The rich young ruler is calling Jesus good. And Jesus says there's only one that's good. The catch-all of that statement is Jesus is saying that he's God. You ever catch that sometimes? These beautiful subtleties in the word of God. I just love them. I just love them when I read through here. So, this, this, so here's the scene. We have two people of completely different standards by humanity, right? How, what we do with things. They're different ethnicities, right? They're different geographical origins. We get a whole bunch of people from different geographical origins here. We're a mess. We're from all over the world here. I love it, right? They had different languages, how they communicated. These people were smart. Somehow, they're 1,500 miles away. They could communicate. These were intelligent people. Their cultures were so different. Even how you greet someone, right? Do you shake hands? Do you high five? Do you fist pump, right? Do you hug? Do you do the three kisses? Cultural differences are a big deal. There's big differences here. Their skin color was different. Philip was a Middle Eastern Jew, right? So his skin was a little darker than mine. But the Ethiopian eunuch, he's from, youth, from uh, Ethiopia, <laughs> he would have been much darker. They looked different. And their sexual status was different. Don't glance over that. This is a big deal in this text. So many human differences. You need to think of it, right? I, this is a funny thing about that. We see all these human differences. You're different than me. I'm different than you. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says the life is in the blood. I'm O positive. Is anyone else here O positive blood by chance? You are, right? So Jessica, uh, uh, Jasmine and I, we, and, 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 and uh, you, woman, <laughs> Evelyn and I, we can share blood, right? It's funny. It doesn't make any difference. In fact, we're even different sexes and we can share blood. Isn't it an amazing thing how we go through these things? Yet we create such divisions. Yet we can share each other's blood. It's an amazing thought. See, humanity's standards are very dividing. We're very dividing. Inclusivity is hard for people, all right? We see differences at a glance, don't we? I can see a difference at a glance, right? Christianity cannot operate by the world's standards. It cannot. What did Jesus say? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. There's no exclusions in that. There's no, go to all nations. Doesn't make any difference. Not at all. The disciple that's going to be made, they could be from the Azores, they could be from Madagascar, they could be from Nepal. Doesn't make any difference. Go to all nations. All nations. And Philip, when he spoke to the Ethiopian, he was, not a, he was not offensive when he spoke to him, right? 
how we present ourselves to people is so important. It really is. It really is, okay? We need to be kind, gracious, and we ask our questions. That is the Christianity that I know. That's the Christianity that I want to be all about. I'm not going to beat someone over the head with the Bible. That's not the Christianity that I know. It just isn't. Going when the Spirit tells us to go, not being offensive when we go. Let me tell you this. People will be offended enough by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be offensive. They won't like hearing that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But I'm a good person. I'm okay. But come on. Let's be realistic about this. That's the Christianity that I know. And this entire encounter that took place was initiated by the Spirit, okay? Now, there's a challenge or perhaps a fear in Christianity that's proliferated, 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 I got it, don't mess with me, is proliferated by men like me from pulpits. By me. What is this? Without trying, I can instigate guilt-driven fear about telling everyone about Jesus. If you don't tell everyone about Jesus, they're going to die and go to hell. You can hear that from many pulpits, right? That's what we do. Churches do it. Pastors do it. People with good intentions will pressure other people to do this all the time. They'll do it all the time. And that's a burden that no one can bear. That's a burden we are never called. We are never called to do. Respond to the Spirit when the Spirit provokes us to act. That is what Philip did. He reacted to the Spirit, didn't he? That's what he did. He did as he was instructed. That is the Christianity I know. It's not beating up people, saying, you got to go tell people. There's groups that go around, they are forced to go door to door during the week to tell people about their, their religion. If you don't do it, you're going to be ostracized. That is not driven by the Holy Spirit. That is driven by men, and it happens in many, many religions. Driven by men. It's not good. It's reasonable to just be driven by the Holy Spirit. We're to act at God's command, not the command of men. Go attach yourself to the chariot. That's what he told him to do. And understand this. It was a setup. Do you understand it was a setup when he told him to go? God knew what was going to happen, right? It was a divine appointment is what it was. And if we will listen to the Spirit, when the Spirit speaks to us, we will find out that we have divine appointments all around us. If we will just listen, God is opening doors for us all the time. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to embarrass her, but I, if I embarrass her, I'm too bad, okay? We were in prayer the other night, and uh, we were down at Lynn's house, and uh, we were going around taking prayers and stuff, and Rebecca started sharing with us about just what transpired with her this week with a client of hers that passed away and, and with the husband, and the family's in a tizzy. Someone, they lost someone they loved, right? And she didn't know what to do or whatever. And you know what she does? She listens to the Spirit. She goes, let's pray. She's telling us, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps because she, she told this testimony. She says, let's pray. And she prayed. And when it got all done, this man that had lost his wife, he had tremendous peace. You know the song was saying? You know, uh, the, the peace that we can have? He had tremendous peace. Why? Because she simply listened to the Spirit. And she prayed with a group of people that didn't know about prayer. Certainly not the way the prayer that God would have us to do. Oh, they could be religious. Everyone could be religious. I'm going to get on with my religion all the time. I don't care about being religious. Are we praying to God? And it was amazing how the countenance of this man was changed by a simple prayer of a woman that's sitting here. And that's any one of us. Why? Because she listened to the Spirit. Just listen to the Spirit. You've got to hear it. You've got to do this. Because sometimes we're not listening. You know what we're like? We're like a child that's hung up on a video game, right? Nee, 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 honey, nee, 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 honey, nee. They can't, they're deaf, right? That's us. Whether we're children or adults, we can become completely deaf to the Holy Spirit. I'm busy. Don't bother me. But what was the text he was reading? It was amazing. It was amazing. Of all the text in the Bible, he was led as a sheep to slaughter, as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Here we are in Isaiah, this, this complex text, right? And it continues on. He said, he said, in, 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 uh, he, he, he said in verse 6, we are, all, we are all like sheep gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. On who? Think of these people at this time. They didn't know who he was talking about, did they? We do, but they don't know. In verse 12, 
and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Who is the he that's making intercession for transgressors? They didn't know the answer to this. They would not have known the answers. This text is impossible until Christ has come. That is not how the priest at the temple would have been explaining Messiah to this, to this Ethiopian eunuch. No one had any idea what the text meant until they meet Jesus. You won't know what the text means. Until the Spirit lives in them, until we become little Christs with our nature and our culture reshaped at the image of Christ. That's the only way you'll understand what this text means. This encounter that took place between the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, it wasn't two trains clashing. It was one soul being grafted into the kingdom of God. And that's how it happens, folks. We listen to the Spirit. The Spirit works in us. We ask questions. We show kindness. And we can share Christ. And if the person will yield to the Spirit, they too can be grafted into the kingdom of God. That's how it works. And what about this eunuch's faith? This eunuch is so important in this story, folks. It really is. Let's get real about the eunuch. He's traveled this far with a show of faith, but I, I believe his faith is born out of emptiness. It really is. Because in general, people don't come to God until they're empty, right? People don't come to God until they're empty. We are empty vessels till God fills us. In Ethiopia, there was nothing to fill him. There was nothing there. What? Whatever the culture revolved around there, it was not going to fill this man, okay? So he's traveled so far to be filled by God. You see, he's searching. He's searching 1,500 miles on foot in a chariot. Whatever it was, 1,500. It could have been a year's journey. Do you realize that? 1,500 miles on foot. It's not like you can say, we're going to go 20 miles a day and we're going to do this. Don't play that game. In a desert, you think you're going to go 20 miles a day? I don't think so. I don't, I'm going to travel at night. Oh, you travel at night in the pitch dark. <laughs> Oh, it's so funny the way we think sometimes. We need to see the context of what these people had to survive to do what they did. Nothing was filling him. He's searching. He even read this text that could not fill him because he could not understand it. He's reading Isaiah. He's not being filled because he doesn't understand it. He's asking Philip to show him. Do you realize this? He doesn't, he doesn't have a clue. And uh, I think he was feeling empty in Jerusalem even more so after he arrived. Okay, the eunuch was geographically different, culturally different, ethnically different, and sexually different. He was different to everyone he was around, okay? Being a eunuch, he had no legacy. He would have no children. So, well, okay, he had no children. This was a big deal in this culture, in the culture of Judaism, right? To have a family to continue on. Think about it. Abraham was a little bit worried about having children, right? Hannah was worried about having children. Rachel was worried about having children. We're going to come into the Christmas season. Elizabeth could not have any children. She was shamed because she couldn't have children. And at a very old age, she had John the Baptist. So having a lineage, having a legacy was very, very important. He wasn't going to have one. But for the eunuch, you see, it goes even deeper than that. The eunuch was not allowed into the temple. Okay? He went to Jerusalem to worship. But the best he could ever do is maybe go to the outer court of the Gentiles. And I don't even know if he could get into there. Remember, he's a eunuch. He's a foreigner. In Deuteronomy 23.1, here's where it comes. He who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Do you realize that? This is the real deal, folks. He wasn't going to be led into worship. He went 1,500 miles, but it ain't happening. Deuteronomy 23 gives a whole list of those who would not be allowed into the assembly of God. And it sounds hard, doesn't it? It's cool. But God is teaching what holiness is all about. He's teaching about it to be perfect and pure is all about, okay? You say, that's cruel, that's hard. Okay, you think that's cruel and hard? Well, you have a newborn baby, right? And I come up working from outside and I'm filthy, dirty, sweaty, and nasty. Can I hold your baby? You gonna let me hold that baby? Uh-uh. Yet we think we can go to God however we want. We've got, to, we've got to come to God with holiness in our mind. We've got to change of thought, change of mind. You're not going to hold my baby, and you're not going to get to God that way, not filthy. That 1,500-mile trek, 1 trek afforded him, uh, he was not afforded any of the privileges that was at the temple. He was excluded. He was excluded. 
The visit to Jerusalem did not fill him. Perhaps that's why Philip finds him reading Isaiah and the part of it that confounded also the teachers at the temple because they couldn't understand this. Isaiah could not be understood. Other parts could. You can't get to Isaiah 53 without Christ and understand it, okay? He's reading it. And he's reading Isaiah. God's word holds many promises, and God's promises are always kept. There's no dead-end streets because we have a God of inclusivity. Because if he's reading the scroll of Isaiah, he could have read on to Isaiah 56, which you may not have read, but you'll hear a couple of verses right now. In Isaiah 56, and how important this would be to this eunuch, in verse 4, For thus saith the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant. Even so to them I will give them my house, and within my walls a place and a name, Better than the sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name. They shall not be cut off. There's a promise to the eunuchs that you may have never read about. Okay? It's in God's word. The eunuch had this promise there. See, he's reading the whole scripture. He's scrolling through his phone. He would not be excluded. And very soon, he would become a temple of the Holy Spirit, wouldn't he? And because the Spirit is going to come on him. It's the inclusivity of God, and that's the Christianity that I know. God is an inclusive God, calling everyone to him. They're going to have his covenant. God said, I will give them an everlasting name, and they shall not be cut off. See, Christianity, since that time, has spread through the world as no other religion, folks. Can you imagine that eunuch after this all happens to him, this whole event that happens here? He goes back to Ethiopia. He is pumped. Because he was empty there. Now he has been filled with the Spirit. He's going to go back there. I bet you would have seen a blossoming of, 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 of Christianity in Ethiopia. I'm certain you would have, okay? It's so funny. He went to Ethiopia first. How many years ago? That's thousands of years ago, huh? Like 1,600 years ago? I guess Christianity is not a Western religion, is it? It was in Ethiopia long before it was in North America. Isn't it funny how we think of things sometimes? We get things kind of backwards. We need to say the word of God. That'll keep us going forwards. Christianity it seeks to include everyone. God has no desire that anyone, anyone, would not come to him. Other religions, they're kind of funny. 90% of Muslims are there in the Middle East and down over in Southeast Asia some. Like 90% of the Buddhists, they're over in, uh, uh, in, uh, in East Asia. Like 98% of Hindus are in India. Christianity exhibits more cultural diversity than any religion in the world. It's because God so loved the world, right? That's what Christianity, that's why Christianity is found all around the world. And who founded the world? Jesus. Isn't it funny when you look at these things? That's why Christianity is all over the world. It's inclusive of everyone. So we see the inclusivity of God here. It was interesting. When Jesus is another exchange with the religious leaders in John chapter 10, what does he say to him? He says, I and my father are one. Boom. What? It was really hard for them, right? Now the response of the religious leaders, I'll read, okay, it confirmed Jesus' claim, but they didn't believe it. Because he said in verse 32 of John 10, for good works we do not stone you, that's nice. You're not going to stone me because of good works. That's great. But for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself equal with God. See, they knew just what Jesus was saying. To be equal to God is to be God. So when people say, does, does Jesus say, ever say, he, he is God? He, yes, he says it multiple times. Maybe not those exact words, but guess what? He wasn't even saying in English, so give it up. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very poor, poor argument, okay? They knew he claimed to be God. Thomas said, my Lord and my God, didn't he? That's what he did. You see, Jesus came for his lost sheep. Do sheep even know they're lost? The people that you speak to every day, do they know that they're lost? Do people know that they're lost? Isn't that interesting? We chit-chatted about this in adult Sunday school. People are so, so lost. Jesus came for us. Jesus came to seek his lo the lost sheep because we've all gone our own way. Jesus came and took our iniquity unto himself, and he paid the price for sin, something we could never do, right? 
I can't climb to a mountaintop and find Jesus. You know, go to the mountaintop. I know it's good for preaching maybe, but I can't go to the mountaintop and find Jesus. Jesus came down and became flesh and found me. And I pray he's found you. He came and found us, okay? We're not going to go find him. We're not. Christianity is the only religion where the founder says, the Father and I are one. Think about that. It's a pretty profound statement when you think about it, okay? Then again, Christianity excludes every other religion. It just does. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty exclusive. Remember I said it's inclusive and exclusive? It is. It is. It's beautiful. Christianity is ultimately exclusive because there's one way, one Savior, one perfect sacrifice. The path was him coming to us. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? That's what Jesus did. So the fervor of the eunuch should be recognized, it should be applauded, it should be replicated, right? What did, the, what, did, what did the eunuch say? What hinders me to be baptized? He was pumped. He wanted to be baptized because now he understood Isaiah 53. He got it down, right? He knew what Isaiah was talking about. What had been a mystery for centuries is now made clear as Philip taught him. He knew what it meant to be filled. The eunuch was filled. He was filled with the Spirit. Philip made it plain. He preached Christ to the eunuch. How long did he preach to, preach to him, right? It's a good question, isn't it? They're in the chariot. How long was that, right? If someone asked you to tell, tell them about Jesus, how long could you talk? How long could you speak? How well do you know Jesus? It's interesting, right? If you tell me to speak about my wife, we've been married for almost 42 years. I can talk a long time. I can talk forever. I will talk to you. I'll talk you to sleep, okay? But how well do we know Christ? How well do we know that? The Christianity I know knows Jesus. And we need to be in the word to know who Jesus is. Jesus had done so much, I think Philip was riding in that chariot for a long time with that eunuch. I think he was. The Christianity I know always has Christ at the tip of your tongue, where it belongs. That's what it needs to be. Oh, you can do everything else, but when you, cease from, when you don't cease from praying, it's very easy. Christ will always be there. You can talk about the Patriots game, and you can talk about Christ in the next breath. Trust me, you can. The Christianity I know reaches out to anyone, folks. Christianity takes anyone. See, the Spirit convicts people and changes them. That's what the Spirit's doing. It's not me, it's not you. Those who do not reject Christ, the Spirit will change their lives. It will convict them of sin. It happens when one repents. It's not that you're accepting Jesus. It means you're repenting of the sin that's in your life. That's what we need to do. This is not, this is not a smorgasbord where we're plucking something here and there and every place else. It's repenting of our sin. Coming to the reality that I am a sinner. I need to repent of what I'm doing. Turning away from it, 180 degrees. So important for us. And what happens when the words of the eunuch come from a person's mouth. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what the eunuch said. Those are the words that got Stephen stoned. Do you realize that? Stephen was proclaiming Christ, and he died for it. He would not negate in it. He, keep, he preached right. You read, you read uh, Acts 7. He just kept going with the word of God from the beginning to the end, and he, he stoned to death for it. I remember those words. So the Christianity I know Christians respond when the Spirit sends. As the Spirit guides us, we in turn can guide other people that are lost in darkness. But it's by the, the guiding of the Spirit, not by your boldness. You know, so we're going to be bold about this. Well, that boldness will come when the Spirit's driving you. You get real bold, but you won't know you're getting bold because the Spirit's in control, not Pete. I get real bold and I put my foot in my mouth. Done it many a time. The Spirit sent Philip. And if we listen, the Spirit will send us to divine appointments. The Spirit will send you to divine appointments. You don't have to dial it up. Christians ask questions out of concern for others, and that's important. Our focus towards others and their well-being is very important. We are to be lights. 
Folks, people do not know that they're in darkness. I don't know if we grasp this. People do not know that they're in darkness. And unless we're a light, they will not see. They will not see. When you ask people questions sometimes, their own answers will convict their heart. You don't need to preach at them. You can ask a question, right? Well, well, tell me, I mean, if you died tonight, would you be in heaven, do you think? What do you think? You ask someone that question, see what the answer is. You can ask another question, but you know what? Their answers will, will convict them, not you. You don't have to convict anyone. The Spirit will take care of it, folks. We just need to be there doing the job we were called to do when the Spirit calls us to do it. And Christianity is inclusive. And folks, we are messengers. We aren't angels, but we aren't judges either. We're just to bring the message that we're doing. And the Christianity that I know never judges people or their appearance because we can't see their hearts. So important for us to remember that. The Christianity I know, my last statement is this. Jesus came as a servant with a towel in his hand to clean people's feet. That's the Christianity I know. Humility will get people's attention. They'll ask why. And like Philip, you then can share Jesus with them. Amen? That's just a piece of the Christianity I know. And it's all from the word of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day, Lord. Thank you for your goodness to us. You're good to us all the time. You really are, Lord. Father, please let us be the Christians that we know that we can be with joy, seeking that your spirit is leading us, not under guilt, not under burden, but out of joy, because we're immersed in your word and your spirit is guiding us. We thank you and praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.